I had a, I had a good career in, in the Air Force. I, was, I got myself out of five or six situations where I, I didn't have a 10% chance of living. I remember one time I took an F-86D from Belleville, Illinois to Duluth, Minnesota in the wintertime. And when I got there, the weather was so bad that you couldn't, you couldn't see 200 feet in front of you. And I was all by myself. And uh, in those days, uh, today you fly with, with the FAA radars. The civilians are telling you how to do it. But in those days, we flew with Air Force radar, one radar station to the next. And the radar station, the weather was good when I left Scott Field in Belleville, but uh, about an hour and a half up to Duluth, the weather, it was snowing, it was night, and it was absolutely terrible. And uh, when I found that out that that was going on, I didn't, I said, give me the weather at Minneapolis. Well, it was worse. I didn't have any place to go but Duluth, Minnesota. And so I turned in, I called the radar station and said, listen, pal, I want to talk to the, I want to talk to the commander. The commander came on and I said, listen, I've got about eight minutes of fuel left and I've got to get in Duluth, Minnesota. And, and he told me that you can't get in Duluth. I said, you, you land me up on final and tell me distances. And I said, I'll land at Duluth, Minnesota. And he said, I can't give you any altitude. I said, I, I said, I'll handle that. You tell me how far I am the runway and, and where the runway is, and I'll land this airplane there. So, and he kept telling me, five miles, four miles, and I'm letting down, you know, I knew, I knew the altitude. So, here I am a couple hundred feet off the ground, can't see anything. Uh, and I got, he said, two miles, one mile, you're over the runway. And I looked down, and the runway was on my left here. I couldn't land on it. So, I made, a, I made a turn to the right, and I, I lit the afterburner, which uses fuel about 10 times faster than it should. And I made a 4G turn to pull down. I landed down. I never called a tower at Duluth. They didn't know I was coming. And uh, I, I, I tried to guess where the runway would be because I couldn't see. And, and I said, it's got to be there. It's got to be there. And I rolled out, leveled, and I looked down there, and there it was. And Jesus. And I landed that airplane, pulled a drag chute, and it didn't work. And there was ice, ice and snow on the runway, and the brakes didn't work. So I got at, at, at those air defense bases, they have a high-speed taxiway where your pilots are sitting alert in, in the hangar, and they're sitting five minutes alert, which means you have to be in the air in five minutes once you get the call. They didn't want to waste time going down the steps, so they have those fireman poles where you slide down. And this airplane, I was going to be in a ditch in a ball of fire, and I saw that high-speed taxiway at the last second. You know, I could see about maybe 100 feet, so I gave it full rudder, and the airplane turned all the way around, and I was, I was going backwards into the alert hangar, about 50, 60, 70 miles an hour. And I saw that was happening. The guys and my buddies in, in the alert hangar evacuated the alert. They, they were listening on the radio. And I saw myself backing in the alert hangar about 50, 60 miles an hour. So I went full throttle. And I stopped that airplane with power about 10 feet from the alert hangar. <laughs> yeah. And if, if I'd bailed out, I had about... Ten minutes to live because you know it's it's twenty below zero at night. The wind's blowing, and the big lake there, you know, loose on the lake, and no way. Another time, I remember at Belleville, I was flying F-86D, held the world speed record at that time, and we 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 flew we flew formation a lot, and had a my flight commander was old uh, Harold Benham, a really neat guy, but but a, a pretty severe person, if I can use those words. And, and he was flying a flight one time, and, and he had a wingman. Then there was an element leader, and then I was wingman on the element leader, four of us. And there was one airplane on his left wing, the element leader on the right wing, and I was on the element leader's wing. And 
we're doing all these things. You know, when you're flying formation, you don't know whether you're upside down or not, and it doesn't make any difference because you just stay on the wing. Wherever the wing goes, that's where you go. The F-86D had what they call a JC maneuver, a Jesus Christ maneuver. And if you did this, the airplane became dynamically unstable and would go increasingly more and come apart. If the, 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 the remedy is to turn loose. If you turn loose, it'll, it'll come out of it right now. But the tendency for a pilot is to correct. And when you correct, you overcorrect and you overcorrect. And <clears throat> anyway, we were going under the Veterans Bridge at St. Louis, across the Mississippi River. And I didn't know it. No, nobody knew it, except Harold Benham, who's leading the flight. We'd been diving down from about 10,000 feet at high speed, and uh, uh, it, it was not unusual. It was against a lot of fly under the bridge, but we did it anyway. You know, it wasn't a big deal in, in those days. You get, they shoot you if you do it today, but, but we're going about 400 miles an hour, and, and Harold Benham went under the bridge, starts under the bridge. His wingman goes under the bridge. The element leader looks up and sees the bridge and pulls up over the bridge. I saw him pull up, and I saw Harold go straight, so I did this. And my airplane got in a JC maneuver. And I pulled about six Gs, and when I, when I, when I regained consciousness, I was about 18,000 feet blood all over the cockpit because I, in the JC maneuver, my, my head was pulled down. I got the, the, stick, the control stick stuck between my head and my helmet. And it, it, it cut me right here and blood just spurt in every place. And I didn't know where I was and I could hardly see out because of the blood. And so, but I was about 25 miles from Scott Air Force Base. So I had the wherewithal to, to turn home and I didn't call the tower or anything. I just landed their airplane. It was a very busy airport. I just landed downwind and pulled off the end of the runway and raised the canopy. And the tower's up there with binoculars. They say, God, blood all over the cockpit. Who is this guy? I didn't even call for landing instructions or anything. And uh, ambulance came screaming out there in the air police. And, and uh, I just sat in the... They said... Get out. I said, I'm not going to get out. I'm going to sit here and rest for a minute. You guys go play someplace else. And they said, okay. And they sat there for about 10 minutes while I just sat in the cockpit of that airplane and, and contemplated, you know, where am I going from here? <laughs> and uh, to make a long story short, they, they, they wrote a... a, 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 a Harold Benham got a letter in his file that, that said he shouldn't be doing that. They, they, that's how they punished him. The, the, the element leader that pulled up, they grounded, permanently grounded, for, for, not, for not filing the flight, for not, not, not staying in formation. And didn't do anything to me. <laughs> but those are the kind of things, you know, I, I flew fighters for 17 years, and you almost don't do that. I mean, the, the story is there are old pilots and there are bold pilots, but there are no old bold pilots. <laughs>